Well, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this beautiful fall arrangement behind me is uh, the result of the hard work of Lucy Bajak, and I just wanted to give her uh, props for doing that for us and setting that up. Lucy, great job. She told me if I didn't say that, she'd be really mad at me. So. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Well, with my apologies to Oscar Wilde, the title for today's sermon is Imitation is the Sincerest Form of Love. Not sure how many of you know Frank Caliendo. How many of you know who Frank Caliendo is? Yeah, there's a few of you. But he's without a doubt my favorite impersonator of all time. He has this unique ability to not only sound exactly like other people, but he has the uncanny ability to make himself look almost identical to the people he's impersonating. His repertoire consists mainly of athletes, but he also does political figures and some Hollywood celebrities. A few years ago, Michelle and I had the uh, privilege of attending one of his, uh, one of his concerts, and his show was masterful, it was funny, and it was very clean, which I'm you know, thankful to say is a rarity. Uh, certainly it is a rarity in this day and age. And no doubt he possesses a lot of natural ability to do what he does. But just like with anything else that you want to be very successful at, he practices the art of impersonating other people like a full-time job. He spends an incredible amount of time studying the mannerisms and the expressions of those he imitates. He rehearses for hours on end so that his audiences will identify immediately with the people he's impersonating. And sometimes if you, if you watch him, he doesn't even have to say anything, right? Because his facial expression or his body language is all that's needed to make you think of the person he's imitating. Well, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that this sermon is not going to be about Frank Caliendo. But it is going to be about the art of impersonating. Are you aware that Scripture commands us, you and I, and all believers, to be impersonators? Now, obviously, it's not to impersonate John Madden or Charles Barkley or George Bush. Now, we're called to impersonate someone with a little more clout. Read this, Ephesians 5.1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. We are called to imitate God. Might take us a while to get his facial expressions down, but that's who we're called to imitate. Be imitators. Well, this word imitators in the Greek, mimetes, and it means to follow by doing the same thing. Webster's synonyms are to imitate, copy, emulate, replicate, mimic, to resemble. And as I said, before Frank Caliendo attempts to go on stage and imitate others, he spends hours upon hours studying and practicing the voices, mannerisms, and the personalities of his characters. Because without knowing everything that he can know about the people that he is imitating, he's not going to be very effective in his attempt to impersonate these famous people. Without an accurate representation, he could very possibly be giving a misrepresentation of who these people are. And it's that process that I want to incorporate into Ephesians 5.1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. We are called to be imitators of God. However, without knowing everything we can know about God, we're not going to be very effective in our attempt to portray him to the world. As a matter of fact, without knowing our God intimately, there's a good chance that we'll be giving the world a misrepresentation of him. Now, I say the world because that's to whom we are called to portray him. Take a look at Matthew 5, 14. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. Now, the world, that's a pretty big stage. It's a large number of people. It's also a pretty tough crowd, the world. As most of us have already discovered, there's a great many hecklers in the world, critics, fault finders, denigrators. Reality tells us this world is that we're being called to imitate our God too, 
is actually a very hostile crowd. But Jesus said in John 15, if you belong to the world, it will love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Could you imagine showing up on stage as an impersonator, and before you utter one thing, the entire audience is already determined they're not going to like you. Here's Jesus giving all God imitators a heads up. They, meaning the world, will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. Why would they do such a thing? Well, Jesus further explains, they will do such things because they have not known the Father. Right here is the catch-22 of the Christian faith. We're called to imitate God, and the audience we're called to imitate God too wants nothing to do with us. Actually, they don't want to have anything to do with God. But because that's exactly who we're imitating, and since God is not physically available to them, then we, God's imitators, become the target of their hostility. Scripture tells us they will do such things because they have not known the Father. This audience of the world doesn't know God. That's why we have to be his imitators, to introduce them to who our God is, to show the world what things like grace and mercy look like, to emulate as best we can the unconditional love that God has waiting for them. That isn't easy, is it? To demonstrate love, grace, and mercy to a whole lot of people who would rather see the word of God shredded than the word of God shared. One thing we have to remember about our audience, however, it's not all their fault. They've had a great deal of help in becoming such a hostile crowd. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Blinded there means being kept in the dark as to what Jesus has done for them, which is opened a way to life eternal. You know, it's pretty easy getting up here every Sunday and preaching to a group of people excited to hear about Jesus and this life eternal that he has graciously and mercifully provided for us. It's another thing altogether to go out there and imitate someone that no one wants to hear about. See, the world is collectively being kept in the dark regarding who God is. That is by demonic design. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks keeping people from coming to know the Lord is religion. I believe religion is the devil's substitute for God. Actually, the devil has done a masterful job in getting people to equate religion with God as one and the same. If you know your religion, that's as good as knowing God. No, it isn't. Not by a long shot. And what you have to take your hat off to the devil for is he has masterfully succeeded in, in using the church to make all of this happen. The devil has been very successful to infiltrate churches and denominations, and most of the time his method for getting through is religion. Religion can keep our eyes off Jesus just as effectively as anything else can. You know, I've heard parents of grown children tell me, you know, I don't care when my children go to church just as long as they go to church. That's some scary advice. It's probably the worst spiritual counsel that you can give to your children. You might as well say, I don't care what God they worship, just as long as they're worshiping a God. I'd go so far to say, I just assume my children and their family don't attend church at all, rather than attend some churches, some Christian churches. Just because the name Christ is out on the marquee does not mean the spirit of Christ is inside that building. And listen, 
If it is void of God's Holy Spirit, there's a good chance another spirit has taken up residence. God is not religion, and religion is not God. Please, don't ever confuse the two. James schools us up on what religion really is. He said, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You want to be a religious person? Then help those that can't help themselves and don't allow yourself to be polluted by this world. You know, when it comes to any place of worship, your first obligation is to align the teaching with the Word of God. That obligation is to yourself and it is to your family, but it is ultimately to God Himself. That goes for the rock or any other church claiming to be part of the body of Christ. You got to know what's being taught. And, and does any of it fly in the face or replace Scripture? Is the most important figure in the church the priest or the pastor, or is it Jesus himself? Is salvation by faith in the core of its teaching? You know, the problem is that people, for the most part, are spiritually lazy. They'll spend three hours a day on a hobby and less than two hours a week on God-centered activities. People come to church and they think, okay, I'm good for the week. Listen, a church, a church service should not be the primary source of where you learn to imitate God. Church is a place where the people of God come together in unity and worship the Lord of glory. Church is where we get encouraged and where we encourage others to keep on keeping on in this God-forsaken world. Church is where we're reminded that this life is momentary and transitory. Don't get too comfy. Don't set down too many roots because it will all one day end. See, church is not a building or a place to go simply to check off your spiritual obligation. Church is the assembly of God's people, his body coming together, sharing what we have in common. Paul writes this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and is in all. Give me an amen there, huh? Amen. Let me get a drink of water. Seven times in a single verse, Paul wrote the, the word one. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And I believe he wrote that to emphasize the unity that the body of Christ is supposed to portray to the world. He also wrote it to let us know how we are to imitate God. What does the body of Christ look like, sound like? Do we look and sound unified in Christ? What does a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit resemble? When the world looks at us, do they see the hope of God? When members of the body of Christ speak, is the world hearing people whose words match their lifestyle? Now, what makes our imitating God different from TV impersonators like Frank Caliendo? A couple of things. Difference number one, Mr. Caliendo's audience know that they're watching a performance, an act, one that turns on and one that turns off. What Paul wrote to the Ephesian church was to be imitators of God 24-7. As a believer, our light should always be on. Imitators, in the Greek, mimetes, and it means to follow by doing the same thing. But listen now. This imitating that we are called to do has nothing to do with performing. The last thing we're called to do is act like God or pretend that we are God. What Paul wrote has everything to do with living our lives like God, following the ways of God. That's not an act. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. It's a chosen lifestyle. It's not being a character. What it is is living out God's character. 
when impersonators walk off the stage after their, their performance, they return to who they are. And here's where we differ sharply from the celebrity impersonators of Hollywood. Who they really are has nothing to do with those they imitate. But who we are has everything to do with who we imitate. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The new that has come in us, in Aubrey Ruan, as of last Sunday, is Jesus Christ himself. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Our stage is the world. And our audience is all the people who happen to come in contact with us every single day. We're not putting on for them. We're not acting for them. We're not called to go into character when we have an audience and then out of character when there's no one around. Contrary to some religious thinking, Sunday is not our performance day. Six days a week we're ourselves and then on Sunday live from Church of the Rock. <laughs> it's time to act like Jesus. We went to a church previous to this one, and one of the things that they did was they, the, the deacons would come out, and they would greet you as your car drove up to the portico. They would open the door, greet you, and, and, and allow anyone to come out, and then you go park your car. So we were, it was in Austin Town, and we were heading there as a family one day, and it was a typical family. None of you could relate to this, but the kids were driving me crazy. Right? They were fighting in the back, and I'm screaming the whole way there, Shut up! Quit that! Wait till church is over. And we're driving, and I'm getting angrier and angrier, right? Because they're laughing at me, because I'm driving. And anyway, he's not going to pull over because we're late, right? <laughs> so here we are. And you guys, wait till church is over. I pull up under the port. He goes, wait till church. the door's open. And the deacon's there. I go, praise Jesus, we're here today. <laughs> Man, I felt like a hypocrite all day long, right? <laughs> we are not to put on, right? We're not to go out of character. We're to continue to live the character of Jesus Christ. Difference number two, we don't imitate our God in an effort to draw applause for ourselves. We imitate our God in an effort to have the audience applaud him. Take a look at Matthew. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. Why? That they may see who you are, your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. That's the goal. And you know what that takes? That takes humility. That takes a lot of humility. And you know who our best teacher in humility was? Yeah, Jesus himself. Look what Paul wrote. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he then humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, he is Lord. Why? How? To the glory of God the Father. Their lack of humility was the reason Jesus so sharply rebuked the Pharisees and the religious teachers. He said this, Everything they do is done for men to see. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. See, they wanted the applause and the glory for themselves. Our call is to imitate God in an effort to glorify God. And listen, that's a bit more difficult than it sounds. I mean, scoring the winning touchdown and, and pointing to the sky, that might look like you're giving God all the glory, right? But what makes the audience of the world sit up and take notice 
is fumbling the ball and losing the game, and then yet in the midst of that, pointing to the sky. Because you see, when we give God the glory only in victory, or only after we land the big job, or only after the doctor tells us that we've given birth to a, a healthy baby, if that's the only time we give God the glory, then we are misrepresenting God to the world. Because the truth is, God deserves the glory whether we win or lose the game or not. God deserves the glory whether we get the big job or we don't. He deserves the glory even when our baby might end up in intensive care. See, when we begin pointing to the sky in the midst of all of those times, now we're starting to get this thing, be imitators of God. Because the truth is, God is worthy of our worship and our praise regardless of the circumstances. He is God in life and he is God in death. And here's the question. Why aren't more people living their lives by imitating God? That's a pretty simple answer. You can't imitate someone you don't know. In order to imitate God, one would have to know God, right? Know his characteristics, his attributes, the traits that make him God. We'd have to know all of that in order to replicate that. To be able to imitate God accurately, one would have to know how God would handle the circumstances of life. Okay, so how do we come to know God and how he would handle all the circumstances in life? Well, we come to know God through his word, through his written word, and through his living word. Look at John 1, 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, we learn of the Father by knowing the Son. What did Jesus tell his disciples? If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So if we learn of God through his son, then who's going to teach us about his son? Well, we come to know Jesus through the supernatural enlightenment of his Holy Spirit. Jesus says, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And the Spirit of God is given at salvation. You know that, right? And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. We're able to imitate God by imitating his son. And we're able to, to imitate his son through the power and revelation that is given to us by his own spirit, the Holy Spirit. This is such a remarkable experience. You want to know what to do and what to say that makes you look and sound like God? All you have to do is listen to and then follow God's spirit within you. Now that may sound fairly simple, but it's anything but. It's going to take effort. It's going to take courage. And it's going to take being intentional. Before Frank Caliendo ever imitated anyone, he had to work at it. It just didn't come. Before we can ever think of imitating God, we have to work at it too. I suppose we could fake it, right? And give our impression of what we think God looks like or sounds like or what God would do. But then if we did that, our audience would be seeing and hearing a misrepresentation of God. And I can tell you there's no shortage of that going on in this world today. The truth is, if you want to be an imitator of God, you're going to have to practice. 
you're going to have to take the script that we have been given and study. And don't be surprised if much of that studying is not done on your knees. But sooner or later, you're going to have to go out onto the stage of the world and begin imitating God. And you know what? You'll probably end up doing it wrong a bunch of times before you ever get it right. But what matters most is the intent of your heart because that's exactly where God is looking. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God's desire is for us to know him intimately. And once we do, then he wants us going out and imitating him, his character. And how will we know when our imitation of God is spot on and effective? Well, there will be fruit. Fruit, yeah. You'll start noticing a bunch of fruit in your life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Imitating God accurately will result in one thing, a fruitful life, a life marked by the character of God. It's truly an amazing thing. Is your life marked with joy? If your audience was asked, would they say that you are a joyful person? Would they say you are a patient person? How about a kind person, a good person? They probably would if they knew that you loved them. Because the truth is, you can't even think about imitating God without first loving your audience. You see, love is God's signature feature. And it's what sets him apart from anyone and everyone else. For God so loved the world, the vast audience, that he gave his one and only son. Every imitator of God must demonstrate love or you are a false imitator. We can, you know, love our audience, our entire audience. <laughs> well, not naturally, no, that's impossible. But we can love them supernaturally. Why? Well, Romans 5, 5 says, God has poured out his love. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Being able to imitate God takes no natural ability at all. It's all done through supernatural ability. And that supernatural ability comes from the supernatural spirit who lives within us. If we follow his lead, our imitation of God will be sincere and it will be precise. And it promises to be effective. Although we may never know just how effective. The truth is, our imitation of God may never end up in an ovation from our audience. We may never experience even one curtain call after imitating God. But then again, we're not called to take curtain calls, are we? Am I now trying to win the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, everything we do, everything we say, as the imitators of God, full-time responsibility, that's not for us. That's for him. And we're not to get caught up in, in the results. No matter how many ovations we get, we may never get one. But you know what? What we do, we do for an audience of one, really. He's called us to the world, but we do it for him. So brothers and sisters, that's, that's our call, to be imitators of the one who has called us, the one 
who has saved us. Would you pray with me? Lord in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that, that we have one that we, we can't imitate. We have one that we know how to imitate because we learn that through the Son by the power of his Holy Spirit. Use us. Use us as impersonators, Father, in our, in our workplace, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. And Father, we just pray that it, it's not a performance. It's not an act. It's truly who we are. Help us to conform to the likeness of Christ. He must become greater, and we must become less. It's in your precious name we pray, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me as we continue?